Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, staying with us. We have 25 minutes to talk about wages. Um, Ten years ago, when this summit was launched, there was also a plan of action that was launched. And the plan of action for the fashion industry also included agenda items around wages. And today we are, in some ways, celebrating under the tagline of rewriting fashion. And obviously, when you think about wages, the question really is, have we succeeded in, so to speak, rewrite the number that is on that paycheck that millions and 60 million workers receive on a monthly basis for the work that they do in the factories that produce the dreams of this industry. And I have a few, three excellent speakers to help me answer that question. So one is Helena Helmerson, who is CEO, COO of H&M. We have Jenny Holcroft, who is Assistant Secretary General at Industrial All, the global trade union who really works on these issues. And then we have Nazma Akter, who is president of the Somalito uh, Garment Trade Union in Bangladesh, and who obviously also uh, has a very intimate uh, understanding of this issue and works very closely with them on a daily basis. So this is a fantastic panel. I look very much forward to the conversation. This is also a hugely complex issue. We are all terribly sad we only have 25 minutes because we do think this requires a lot more attention. We also talked about, um, before going in, that it was interesting to observe that over the past two days, we've had a lot of focus on climate issues and biodiversity and environmental questions, whereas social issues doesn't, haven't really quite surfaced to um, where they need to be. And Mike Berry just spoke about a climate crisis, he spoke about di biodiversity crisis, he spoke about inequality crisis. Wages is an inequality crisis. It is not just a question of wages, which comes across hugely technical, it's about equity, and it's about fundamentally about equality. So we're going to dive into it, um, and I'm going to ask Nazma um, my first question, and that is, 10 years has passed, what, ha what type of progress have we seen Thank you. It's uh, only Bangladesh across the world. Uh, actually, if we say the t past 10 years, and especially if you are going to Bangladesh, last six years, the Rana Plaza uh, disaster, there is the salary is increasing in Bangladesh, and it is 95 USD for that entry level, which is not sufficient for us. So this is the things are uh, changing. But it's, uh, the most of the things what we are seeing, the people who are running business to our country and other country, they are mainly going for the cheap labor market, especially exploiting the female, because this morning people are talking about the gender issues, but the gender means women. So they are the exploitation from the whole supply chain. Uh, even uh, uh, I just back from the Ethiopia, it's a very horrible situation, a lot of high fashion and also fast fashion, everyone is working. Their salary also 25 to 20 USD, which is not sufficient. Yeah. And it's very difficult to survive their family. Malnutrition is a big challenge for the female workers. Their children are separate from the parents. So a lot of things are addressing. And mainly there is a big challenge. The respect and dignity is a challenge because when people say the labor market is cheap, the human beings are cheap. So while you think that uh, the goods are expensive, but the human are very cheap. So that kind of things are very challenging. But if we are thinking about the last 10 years, Bangladesh, we have like uh, after Rana Plaza, more than 700 unions are uh, organized, and number of factory has a quality bargaining, and individually also we get some uh, uh, increase, uh, increment and in salary through the collective bargaining agreement. And also we have something is uh, industrial has signed the global framework agreement with H and M, Inditex, Chibo, and others brand. So mostly we work also, the H&M uh, has like a national monitoring committee, so I'm also one of the member. So we are also trying to daily issues, the things are also improving with the other brand also. Mm. So things like this, but the things, the way are going, it's not the, uh, uh, properly and need to be changed because waste is a very important issue. It's also related with the productivity. And most of the brand here, this morning I seen like 
Burberry, Karen, and the Adidas, Nike, MNS, they are talking about the sustainability. But you know, in our case, in the practical, the high luxury fashion brand, fast fashion like H&M, or discounter like Kik, or Aldi, or Lidl, the workers are not getting different treated and different benefited. That is the big challenge. So where the, our prof profit goes to the multinational yeah. or the company, but our workers are hungry. So that is the nothing who is selling 200 uh, uh, euro the t-shirt or the sh shirt, or who is selling two euro. Our workers' livelihood is not different. The working condition is this. Their job is not uh, ensuring. So that is why the purchasing practice and fair price and respect and dignity, as long as not coming, it will not change. So that is why the company, the consumer, who are taking goods from like Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Cambodia, Myanmar, scenario is same. Mm. So how we have to get better wages and better life for them. We are talking about the sustainability, but most of the workers who are working in our country and different country, after 40 or 45 years old, automatically they need to leave the factory because they don't have energy, they don't have productivity power. So where they have to go after 40 years, whole youth and young generation are contributing for the fashion industry, developing our country, the supplier, the multinational consumer, everyone is getting profit, but we don't have. That is why we need okay. freedom of association <clears throat> and collective bargaining. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, and I think you, you introduced a, a SOP issue uh, when we talk about wages, and that is the gender gap that also exists. So just to give people a sense of it, we're looking at gender gaps uh, around 50% in many Asian countries. In other countries, it may be 40%, but that's really the gap we're looking at, and we're looking at same pay or pay for same type of job. Um, so that's like a SOP issue, and then I, I think we may have time to look at it, but maybe not, because there's so much else to talk about here. Thanks for that, Nazma. Helena, from a corporate perspective, your work on this issue for the past 10 years and even before then, um, what is the change that you've seen? Um, I think we can all agree on the fact that looking at the vision that all workers should earn, of course, a fair living wage, that we still have a lot to do uh, in the industry as a whole. Um, and I think that being part of setting uh, the fair living wage strategy back in 2013 and then getting a job where you actually get the responsibility to execute and make it happen has made me learn a great deal on what is working and what is not. Uh, and as we have said before earlier today in panels, also yesterday, uh, the silo-oriented work doesn't really have that impact. For example, what, what to, do you mean by silo? to make um, a f one factory okay. look perfect, yeah. or for one company to meet a government, mm. or to make one product that is very sustainable, has other kind of benefits. But if you really want to drive systemic change, and raise the bar for the whole industry when it comes to wages, you need to consistently work on, on different levels, yeah. and that will require more time. So if I just focus on where we have seen patterns that have shown great results, uh, I would pick, first of all, I think it's very important to not neglect the work uh, of empowering the workers themselves, to get a stronger voice. Mm -hmm. And that you can do in different ways. You mm -hmm. can do, do awareness raising, you do trainings, you work with unions, you work with your suppliers uh, to make that happen. And that I think is really important for them to know their rights and know how to negotiate themselves their wage. Uh, and we've done a lot of work to make sure that the workers in the suppliers' factories are represented by democratically elected uh, representatives. And the other 
area where I would definitely say that we know we can see better results is to work together with our suppliers to implement wage management systems in factories. Uh, and that means that the wage should be transparent and the workers should understand the level of the wage. They should understand how to get a raise. And it should be connected with your experience, uh, with the work tasks and so forth. Uh, and when we kicked this off in 2013, uh, that strategy, uh, we were working with three factories. Now it's 655 and we're covering 930,000 workers. And we can see that in these factories, the wages are higher than in the others. So this is really something I would love more companies and more suppliers to work on, because this is a proof. And then, of course, that's not all. You can't only work within factory walls with our size. Mm. So then, industry-wide, of course, we're super proud of the work we do with ACT, uh, to work for um, industry-wide collective bargaining agreements that is supported mm -hmm. by our purchasing practices uh, from brands, and this can be a true game changer of not relying on minimum wages, but actually raising the bar. And that also means that we as brands need to look ourselves in the mirror, look at our purchasing practices. We've done a few changes ourselves. Uh, for example, uh, blocking the compensation part when we negotiate the prices and so forth. So I think there's a lot of things that brands can do within that area. And can you just before I hand it over to, to Jenna, because I'd love to hear her thoughts about how things have evolved, but you talked about that the efforts that you have made have translated into higher wages. Have they translated into high enough wages? No, I think we still have a lot of work yeah. to do. So, of course, and that's a little bit what I mean, that uh, to be able to, for example, communicate in a good way. It can be very tempting to do quick fixes, but this kind of systemic change demands consistency and that you stay focused on the vision. Of course, we're not done. No. We have a lot of things uh, to do, but we, of course, we measure the results, so we know that at least we see true patterns, that wages are going up when you take these kind of actions uh, in collaboration with others. Okay, thank you. Jenny, you've been part of this for many years and mm -hmm. you also played a role in setting up the accord that I think a lot of you in the room will know about. Um, what's your analysis of what has gone wrong? Because uh, this has been on the agenda for so long. We've mm -hmm. talked about so many conferences and yet the, the progress we see is just not good enough. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. Um, I mean, let's look at where we are. What we have is an industry that has been founded on low wages. Yep. It's been founded on a race to the bottom, searching for the cheapest price. So the industry has developed in that context. And for a long time, we've been sitting there with these very entrenched systemic problems. It's not just low wages, it's everything that leads to that as well. So you've got very long working hours, you've got a preponderance mm -hmm. of temporary contracts, you've got all of this is because not enough money is staying in the factories. And this has been a problem for a long time. The question is, how do you address that? Mm -hmm. And I think what we've seen is many efforts over the years by brands to try and do what they can from where they sit. So as Helena has already mentioned, you know, you, uh, uh, responsible brands have said, well, let's work with our factories and try to fix that. What we've learned over many years of doing that is that on the, the issue of wages, this is not going to affect the change. Mm. If you think about it, it's logical. Um, if you work with a factory, and this is where the limitate, this is why H&M is working on those two levels, working in the factory level, but also the industry level. Because if you work on the factory level, you can certainly improve the wage management system. You can certainly get more fairness around what level people are paid and, and where they sit in, within that factory. What you can't do is significantly increase the wages in that factory relative to all of the other factories, yeah. because then that factory will become uncompetitive and jobs will be lost, which is completely counterproductive. So it doesn't work, and, and many companies are still stuck in that um, mindset of, we know we have to do something about wages, we're going to do it on our own. 
The evidence has shown over the years, you may as well not bother because you're not going to get there. And it's just the structure of the industry as well. Factories do business with many, many, many brands. How is one brand going to yeah. somehow change the, the, the business in that factory? It has to be collective, it has to be collaborative. Yeah. So what we've learned is we've learned not what to do, but we've also learned what we need to do. And it, it, Helena has already referred to it. We need to have a system that is going to raise the wages for all workers in an industry so that brands that are sourcing from that country will have to abide by the new higher level. The problem is, and this is what we're also tackling, is that employers will not agree to raise the level of wages if they know that they can't get the business that will support that. So that's, we've talked about, mentioned the word act a couple of times. I think we'll probably get a, get a chance yep. to explain it. But it is, it is linking those two necessary elements to create a system for garment supply chains that will enable sustainable increase of wages over time. So in essence, it's about enabling employers and trade unions in a country to negotiate for a higher wage that applies to the whole industry and to support that through the purchasing practices of brands. Yeah. So the brands that we work with have made public commitments about how they're going to change their purchasing practices so that they're not undermining higher wages either through pricing but also th through things like placing late orders, making changes, having punitive fines on factories, a whole range of things. And we've been working intensively on this to deliver the system, but we need more, more brands to get yeah. involved because it is the only way to bring structural change that will enable higher wages to become part of the, the garment industry uh, and really address this problem in, in a sustainable way for all time so that we're not at the point of... Uh, and I think there's a lot of desire among consumers to say, where can we shop so that we know uh, we're buying clothes that have been uh, paid for by workers that are paid properly? The answer is, right now, nobody can say yeah. that yeah. because there are no conditions in the industry that allow for that. What we're trying to do together is to create those conditions so that every brand can say, we have purchased clothes from workers who are being paid properly. And it sounds like this is this is a issue, or maybe the issues where collective action is the most needed, and it is even it is what is required in order to make the progress that we want to see. And I think all of the three of you have been part of this effort of setting up ACT. Um, and ACT really, as you talked about, is very much about building those structures that enables collective bargaining, um, the structures that also enable brands to be more thoughtful about how they actually buy their stuff and how that actually impact wage setting structures. Um, maybe just hear a little, just a few, few words from you, Helena, on, on why are you getting into ACT and, and what can you tell other companies in the room about being involved in ACT, why they should become part of it? Right. Um, it was really when we came to a point and we said that we see that our actions are not having the right impact. And we had a lot of stakeholder conversations, of course, with industry all and with other unions. Uh, we met, uh, well, many different experts to understand what is it that we actually want to do if we really want to make a change. Uh, how should we approach this? Uh, also looking at the fact that as a brand, you can't put the level of what the wage should be because you work with suppliers and they should, of course, have mechanism in place in their factories so that workers could negotiate their wage. Um, and that's also when we came together and we discussed how to kind of set this agenda. And I actually think that Regardless of size of the brand, this is such a great opportunity yeah. to come together because it's absolutely impossible. Even for us with our size, it's so hard to drive that change alone. So I just think that ACT is one of the collaborations uh, where I would love to see more brands because regardless of size, it's an opportunity where you can use the power of others mm. 
to actually drive that change and not rely on minimum wages to be annually reviewed because that is going too slow. Nasma, how are you going to work with ACT in, in, in Bangladesh and how is that going to make a difference for the workers you represent? About the ACT? Yes. Because it's also under processing, we are going to start because uh, Jenny is going to Dhaka and we will talk with the uh, supplier brand and also union and this. But at this moment, we are trying to at uh, individual factory level where they have union. So we are trying to submit the chart of demand so they can increase some factory like 7 to 10 percent or uh, incentive and other issues and so productivity and different uh, maternity protection, different health issues which is also related with the contract, so which is also support and help their factory. So this kind of the way, but it's very small person, but we need to be more commitment from the com uh, uh, company who are producing, especially Asia is a very important for the uh, European, American, all of them, because we are producing 80% production for the across the world, so they have to be commitment, really, to how the workers, boys, especially the women empowerment issues have to be addressed, and also they have to be running business with the supplier, long-run relationship, and many cases we face the uh, company like H&M or other, they are running business with the different sourcing company, like agency, they are not look after the workers' rights and benefits, they are only quality and the price. So this is also make uh, like uh, damage, like see the Rana Plaza, 32 brand was working where the Italian high fashion also producing through the subcontracting. So that modern day slavery, this issue should be addressed to how the people get the proper wages and things and a lot of issues that happen, the gender-based violence issues, many area. So it needs to be proper commitment and the, from the union side, responsible unionism. And we have to be, get the good uh, image, how to run the good business from the company side as well as the union side. So we need to work together and we need to be support because without workers, without uh, a human cannot be changed. Also, that now in the days we are challenging with the auto machine, the industrial fourth point, uh, which is also challenging and reducing women's job. So that also need to be think that women can do everything. So women has a lot of burden. They are working, they are cooking, they are take care of everything. Yeah. But the, when people are coming to work, women is a cheap labor. So how we can get that dignified working condition. So we are fighting, we are negotiation, and we are trying to educate workers about their rights and responsibility, how they can make the betterment of the industry as well as their livelihood. So these kind of things also need to be commitment from the high fashion brand to the discount, because every one factory, what Jenny said, mm -hmm. one production floor is not producing for one brand. So there is strain brand, the high to top to bottom, so that people had to be commitment. And just want to get, thank you for that, I think. <laughs> and I think that is a conversation that we need to have that's more about what is the gender lens on this, but we're not going to have that today, unfortunately. I do want to give the final words to Jenny, and our time is up, but I nonetheless think it's important to ask this question. So it's just a question from the audience about why wouldn't we work on these issues through the Sustainable Apparel Coalition? What's your answer to that question? Sorry, what was Why that? wouldn't we work on these issues through the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, the SAC? I don't know enough about the SSC to be able to answer that. I mean, the thing about wages is it's about workers, yeah. and, and workers need to have a voice in wage setting. That means that trade unions need to be negotiating wages. I mean, wages have always been negotiated. There's basically two ways that you can set wages. One is through national minimum wage, and we know in the garment producing countries that the national minimum wage levels are set way too low and are never going to rise to the level of what we would say is a living wage. So we need to have the traditional mechanism of wage bargaining. It's, wages can't be determined from the top down yeah. because that, that does not make them enforceable or sustainable. Uh, a, an employer can pay what, what, more one day and then decide the next day to stop paying it. So you need a systemic change. So I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, um, but 
top-down initiatives can't work. It has to be top and bottom coming together and creating a system um, that works for the way that the businesses work in the, at the brand level and the way that wages are actually paid to workers in the factories. And that's what we know about and that's what we need to be enforceable and sustainable. Thank you. So this is an invitation <clears throat> to all of you to go onto the uh, website, take a closer look at ACT. It is open for everyone. It's not a question about whether you're a big brand or not. It's open for all companies who care about working on wages. And I think as the message here is it's a, it's a system-changing initiative, and that's why we need to support that one initiative as opposed to dreaming up five other new ones, as mm. sometimes happen in this industry. Yeah. Um, so let's get behind ACT, and uh, I think the next ACT is, I don't know if it's lunch or if it's additional speaker, but thank you so much to my wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you.